here we go. Chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, sick named Lazarus, during chapter, uh, John chapter 11, of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. <coughs> then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was near unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. If I remember, I'm shooting from the hip. It's about thirty miles. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as the, as soon as she heard that Jesus, I might be off on that. I think the distance might be less than that. But anyway, verse twenty. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yeah, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now, just because we have some visitors this morning, I just want to take one quick second and I want to explain the word Christ. Some people believe they don't really, and I'm not making fun, but even myself for a period of time, I thought that was his last name. I didn't know any better. But the word Christ is a title. It means anointed one. In the Greek language, the word Christ means anointed one. In the Hebrew language, the same word is, is the concept is Messiah. It means to be smeared with oil. In the Old Testament, when, the, when a servant of God like David the king was smeared with oil, it means he was anointed, yeah. he was separated, he was sanctified out for God's use for his kingdom ministry. And through the scriptures of the Old Testament, through the annals of human history, through thousands of years, God through the prophets had foretold that the anointed one was coming. Amen. So the people of God understood that the Christ, the anointed one was coming. And what Martha has a revelation of that. And Jesus asked her, did you not know that I am the resurrection and the life? And her response once again has to do with the fact that I know that you are the Christ. Amen. And so it goes on to say in verse 28. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come, and he calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come, where Jesus was, and saw him, 
she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Amen. I want to go down a little bit right here to verse uh, 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. You know what? Let me I apologize. Let's go back up to verse 39 real quick. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them, the things which had happened. Now, I want us to, I want you to also be aware that there's a passage in, in John chapter 12, maybe in verse 9 and 10. I don't know if you have your Bibles or not, but if you do, you can turn there with me real quick. And I just want to, 9 through 11, I'm just going to read that too. This is, this is uh, some time after this has taken place, just six days before the Passover. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But in verse 9 it says, much of the much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. All right. Praise the Lord. So I wanted you to see that. Now, now what we see is, is that this story of Lazarus being raised from the dead is nestled right before the next chapter of chapter 12, which starts off saying it was six days before Passover and Jesus entered into Bethany. And the Bible says that he entered into Bethany into the house of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And so six days before the Passover, Jesus now goes back to the same people's house, Lazarus and his two sisters, and he takes the Passover there. He's preparing it six days before Passover, but he's preparing to move in to Jerusalem. Now, many of the people that come to this church often, and we, we teach the Bible a lot, and we talk about the Passover a lot. I mean, if anybody has come to the Bible study for any length of time, we talk about the Passover like almost every time I preach, I mention Exodus chapter 12. Because it's an Old Testament type about 2,000, about 1,440 years or so before the time frame of Jesus that represents the cross. The Word of God teaches that God told uh, Moses to instruct the people. He was about to deliver them out from Egypt, amen. He said, you take a lamb and that has no blemish and I want you to collect its blood in a basin and I want you to paint it on the doorpost and the side post of your door. And whenever I come through, I'm going to send the death angel. In other words, judgment is coming on the land. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The New Testament thought that you and I need to understand is, is that in the same fashion that God instructed Israel to paint the doorpost and the side post with the blood of a blemishless lamb, is the truth that you and I must paint the doorpost of our heart with the blood of the eternal lamb. He who was without sin, he who who never was disobedient, he who followed the Father's instruction and offered his sinless life on the cross in our place. Now what you've done, now how do I apply blood to the doorpost of my heart, preacher? Well, you got to hear the gospel preached first off. We need preachers to still preach the gospel. And the gospel isn't just relevant for your life and to help pay 
pay your finances. God will straighten all that up for you, by the way. Did you know that? When you give your life to Jesus, when you have an encounter with the real Jesus, whatever your problems were before, the Lord will begin to mend your life. He will begin to change you. Hallelujah. He will begin, the Holy Spirit will begin like medicine to begin to apply himself to your life. Don't tell me that he can't do it because you're looking at somebody that he did it in. Amen. That's why I'm so passionate. Don't tell me that God can't set free and resurrect from the dead, the drug act. I was in my third rehab by the time I was 19. Detention hall, how many times? Didn't know the first thing or have any kind of work ethic. Didn't know anything about any of that. But whenever I got a hold of the real Jesus and he moved into my heart and I began to read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit with the scriptures, as I believed them, began to change things on the inside of me. The Lord said, boy, you can't just be an employee. You got to act like it's your business and you got to work for them like you're working, like you own the place. Not just because you're trying to please your employer. I'm your employer. You're working for me and you represent me. And whenever you speak my name out of your mouth and they see your actions, come on somebody, we need some help down here. And they see your actions, they're connecting you to me. Why did you say that? It wasn't part of my message. I just want you to know that guess what? There is practical theology in the Bible, but the way that you get to practical change in your life is by seeing the truth of the gospel, by receiving the real Jesus, and by allowing the real Holy Spirit. Come on. Why do you keep saying real? Because there's a fake Jesus that people are preaching. Right. Yeah. And there's a fake spirit that's connected to it. What are you talking about? That's negative, yes? The Bible teaches this. Paul warned the church of Corinth that they would come preaching another Jesus, that it would have another spirit connected to it, and that it was a completely different gospel. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that much of the modern church today, this feel-good message that's going on out there, this practical theology, don't get me wrong, I'm about practical theology, but once again, until he changes the inside of the man, hallelujah, then the members don't change. Until the heart is renewed and recreated, then now my hands continue to do the old things they used to do. My feet still go the old places they used to go. My mind still thinks the way that it used to think. But if you let the Lord in, Hallelujah. Amen. He'll begin to change things. Hallelujah. That's what happened on that Passover day. The Passover lamb was painted his blood on the doorpost. Judgment came through the land. But God spared his people. And you and I, when we paint the doorpost of our heart, in other words, Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. Man, I tell you, I was able to witness to several people even at work last week. It was just like the door Lord was opening up doors. And one of the things that I've been telling people here lately is this. I'm not talking about intellectual Belief in God. Do you understand that? Do you, you understand there's a difference between cognition, cognitive. What does that mean? Mental functioning. You got mental functioning this morning, amen? You're, you're, we're awake, right? Your, your brain can know that there was a man named Jesus that died on two pieces of wood, but that doesn't mean that you've truly been born again. You can intellectually understand what I'm trying to tell you, but that doesn't mean that you've bowed your knee to Jesus. In order for a person to truly be born again, they have to hear the gospel that says, born of Adam, you're born in sin. Born of Adam, you're not okay with God. And if that's offensive preaching, then guess what? I'm just preaching to you what the Bible says. The Bible says man born of Adam is born in sin, but God has a remedy. And just as the, the, the blood was painted on the doorpost, when you and I paint the blood on the doorpost of our heart and say, yes, God. I hear that gospel message. I understand that I'm not okay. And that you provided a lamb. And that you allowed that lamb to be slain. And God, I invite him not just into my head, but I invite him into my heart. Lord, I bow my knee to you. Lord, I've been living my life my own way, doing my own thing. But I want you to be not just my Savior so I can go to heaven. I want you to be my Lord. I want to let you sit on the throne of my heart. I want to give you my life, Lord. I'm tired of living for myself because everywhere that I go and everything that I do, I keep messing things up. And I want to give you control, Lord. I want to give you control of my life. Six days before Passover, Jesus entered into Bethany. But, but before that, this miracle takes place. This miracle, this physical miracle, where the Bible says that Jesus is told that Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, roll the stone away and let the dead come. Come forth, Lazarus! And the dead awaken to life. And they get up and they walk out. We see a physical miracle.
taking place. But I need you to understand something. The main purpose that Jesus performs this miracle is a teaching lesson for them and also for us. Because he does it not long before he himself will go to the cross. Not long before he himself will go to the cross, he will die, he will be buried, placed in a tomb, and then he himself will resurrect from the dead. And so he provides this miracle for eyes to see, for it to be written on paper, and for you and I also to read it and to be able to believe that the God that we serve has the power over death. He has the power over sin. Hallelujah. He has power over the grave. He makes dead things live. And as a matter of fact, that's the title of my message this morning. It's an interrogative. It asks a question. Can the dead still live? Can the dead still live is the question that I have to ask you this morning. Amen. Does the God you serve have power to make dead things live? And so there it was. The Passover was coming and, and Jesus. And you know, one of the things that I know, there's a couple of things that I realized for sure that Jesus was waiting or wanted to, he wanted, he wanted Lazarus to die. <laughs> I know that sounds harsh. I got to be careful because that's another thing I was, I was kind of accused of that, I don't, that people don't understand what I'm saying. And I'm going to say this in the midst of this message. I'm going to say that there's going to come a time in your life that you're going to have to want to die. Yeah. Now, when I say that, you didn't think I meant go home and take your life, did you? No. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. No. I'm talking about die spiritually. Die to old self. Die to old ways. Die to your previous understanding yeah. of the world that you lived in. Yeah. Understand that? Amen? Okay. And so, <clears throat> look at what it says right here, though. It says in verse 6 of chapter 11. Actually, verse 4. When Jesus heard... That he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Look at this next verse. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. They're like, oh my goodness, Lazarus is sick and he's going to die. Let us be moving fast and rapidly to get there so that we can save the day. Now, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he abode there two days still. He waited. Let's, let's let this thing take its course. Let's let Lazarus go to sleep. Let's let him die. There's a reason. Because Jesus wanted Lazarus to die. Yeah. So that this miracle could be performed. Yeah. So that the eyes could see. Yeah. That he had power over death, yeah. hell, and the grave. So that they would be able to believe. So that his own disciples would be able to believe when he himself resurrected from the dead. So that they would carry this gospel message forward. And that they would tell someone else. And that the life of God all of a sudden would come on the inside of somebody else's heart. And then they would go tell somebody else. And that it would filter down through thousands of years. And that you would end up getting the same life in you. And that you would tell somebody else. And that this thing would continue to grow because this is God's plan for humanity because we're not just living for today. Amen? Do you understand that? Do you realize that you could end up being a successful person and completely miss the whole point that God had you on this earth? Do you believe that today? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not trying to convince you to believe what I'm telling you, contrary to some popular belief. But I'm here to tell you that I firmly believe that this, your presence on this earth it's not just to see how much education you can get. It's not to see how much money you can make. Man. It's not to see how cool of a car you can drive. Man. Or, or to find, you know, or even the best life now. Oh, Lord, help us. <laughs> Don't pick on Joel. I like Joel. Well, you know what? Joel ain't preaching the truth. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Amen. Call that negative if you want. But if you ain't putting sin and blood and cross in your gospel, you got another gospel right. of another kind. That's right. And all of those things are important as you go through life. I believe in success. I got my, my daughter's working on a biology degree. I might go to school, girl, because you know what? One day, you need to be able to pay your own bills. You don't have to go to school. You, but let me, just, let me just take a second about that. This is something that the Lord put on my heart. It doesn't have anything to do with my mess. But you know, well, it kind of does because, once again, we're going back to practical living. And everybody, right now, the economy's bad. And people are struggling to find a job, right? I had a friend of mine that told me the other day that he found a job. And I hope that it ends up working out, you know. But 
But this particular person has a skill that other people don't have. He's a fitter. And the truth of the matter is, I can't fit. I don't know how to do the math that it requires to fit. I don't know how to work the angles that it requires to be a fitter. But this person can fit. He can go and he can take a test for fitting and he can pass a test for fitting. And because of that, he can get a job. Guess what? They got a whole lot of other people looking for a job right now that can't fit. They can't do the math. They can't work the angles. The point that I'm trying to make is this. In this practical thing called life, whenever you're living for Jesus and you see that, guess what? There's everybody scurrying for the same job. And you might do well even if you don't want to go to college and you're having a hard time putting a little bit of effort into some things. Putting a little bit of work on. Don't get mad at me when I get to preaching good. Putting a little bit of work into bettering yourself for the sense of separating yourself from the rest of the crowd. Does that make sense what I'm saying? If God would open up a door for you and give you a window of opportunity, it might require some work on your behalf. But if you'll do it, you can actually increase your the, the fact that somebody wants you. The fact that there's a spot for you. The fact that there's a job for you. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Amen. I just want to encourage people that in this life that we live, yes, I'm all about it. Work hard. Amen. Separate yourself from the pack. But this is the thing. When you get that degree, when you get that trade, and it separates you and you get that job, you may not buy into this, but what I'm here to tell you is this, is that your purpose on that job is bigger. I can't drive it. I can't work on an ambulance. I probably could do some of those things, but I, I can't work on an ambulance. And the point I'm trying to make is, is that people have skills that other people don't. But when you get on that job and you let Jesus come into your heart and begin to move some things around, that's another thing I've been telling people lately. When you really get saved, there's no confusion. The Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, that you get sealed with the Holy Ghost. That means the Holy Spirit makes your heart His home. And when the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, He starts <laughs> rearranging furniture. He starts changing things. And the way that you used to think ain't the way that you think anymore. And you can't hardly contain yourself because the love of God is changing you. And you got to start telling people. So what I'm trying to say is this. The big picture is whenever you get that new job, or wherever it is that you are, just keep it in the back of your mind for right now. You might not be ready to carry a cross, but your purpose in this life is to give glory to God. Amen. Your purpose in this life, Leonard Ravenhill, a great revivalist, said this. He said that this life is nothing but a dress rehearsal for eternity. Amen. I believe that. Yeah. In other words, if God is real, I use the conjunction if for all those people out there that don't believe me. If God is real, then the whole thing is, what are we going to do with the Son? Will we believe God at His Word? Will we realize that He's offering eternal life? He's offering an eternal kingdom. And will we receive His Son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that He offered for the payment of the penalty of our sin in order to live for something bigger than today, in order to live in eternity with Him, simply because of the fact that He's a good God? Does that make sense? Amen. So we're six days before Passover. Jesus performs this resurrection miracle. Hallelujah. And I wanted us to, to, to learn. He waited. He wanted Lazarus to die so that he could prove that he had power over the dead. And I wanted you to see. I wanted to, to, to look a little bit. I wanted to learn a couple of things from both Martha and Mary and also from Thomas. Well, let's look at Martha first. The Lord says right here in verse 24. Well, Martha said unto him. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So not only does Jesus offer eternal life, not only is he telling us that one day your physical life is going to end, you're going to breathe your last breath here, and then when you do that, you're going to take your first breath there, Amen. wherever there is. There is an eternity that awaits our, 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 our immortal soul and spirit, if you will. Amen. And so physically, you're, you're going to die, but Jesus says that if you will believe in me, the resurrection and the life, you'll never die. But not only that, he's also saying, he that dies will live if he believes in me. 
Now, I got to tell you that, yes, even if you believe in him and you die physically, you will live again. But also, those born of Adam are born dead already. And that if they would believe in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, they also can live again. I got to encourage you this morning because I don't know what you've been in. I don't know what you've been in, what you've been going through. I don't know what people have told you. I know what people are telling me out there. There ain't no hope for some of you. People are telling me out there there's no hope for some of you because some of the things that you're dealing with are just too big for God to really do a creation miracle. It's going to require the psychologist. It's going to require the addictionologist. It's going to require the program. You're going to have to work all of these steps. You're going to have to do all of this stuff. And even whatever you've done, and you get your certificate in your hand, completion, finish the program, you still got to let buddy, you are a recovering addict. It doesn't matter how long you've been in it. It don't matter what you say about God. It doesn't matter what you say about his word. You're still in recovery. That's a lie from the pit of hell. My Bible says something different. It says that God has created, you're a new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. God looked at the cross as an instrument of death. God kills things at the cross and he breathed resurrection life into new things. He gives life where there was previously death. I got to tell you something, Martha. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And though you might have been dead before, hallelujah, I'm here to tell you that you can now find life. Amen. Point number two having to do with Mary. Mary shows up over there at the, at the grave weeping. She shows up at the grave weeping. Lord, if you just would have been here. If you just would have been here, Lord, then he, my brother wouldn't have died. See, you and I know something that Mary didn't know. And when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he abode two more days there still. He purposely waited. Mary doesn't understand that. She just sees Jesus showing up a little bit too late. And I don't know about you. Well, I do know about you because we all, we all find ourselves in many times similar situations. Sometimes it just seems too late. Sometimes the circumstance seems too late and it seems too hopeless. And what I'm here to tell you is that it's never too late. Amen. Hallelujah. Right. And as long as you can put your faith in Jesus, as long as you can hold on to him, it's never too late. I want to encourage the person you're going through marital problems. It's yes. never too late. Yes. Jesus can resurrect your marriage. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Mama, hold on. I know you think you're going to find your boy dead on the side of the road one morning. I didn't tell you that story that time I was riding in the car with my ex-girlfriend when I was a kid. I thought about that this morning. Okay, I'll tell you all the story. Yeah. I'm riding in the car with this girl, and we've been dating all this time, and I can't get along with nobody, much less a girlfriend. And, you know, I'm over here thinking, you're, gonna, you're about to pull this car over, and you're going to drop me off. I ain't dropping you off. We're gonna, I'm going where I'm going and you coming with me. I said, you better pull this car over, and, and, and you better drop me off because I'm going to do my own thing. And so what do you think this fool does? Jumps out of the car. Jumps out the car. <laughs> 25, 30 miles an hour down Johnson Street, Lafayette, rolls into the ditch, gets up, and goes and does his own thing. <laughs> and you know what, Mama? All I know is, thank God, you didn't find me dead on the side of the road one morning. But it's never too late. Whenever there's always hope, I had a sister over here in Morgan City, Louisiana, going to a Pentecostal church in Burwick, and the whole church was praying, Lord, deliver that boy out of the grips of Satan. Lord, never too late. I don't care how bad it looks. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on where you are in your own life. Hold on to Jesus and trust and believe that he is able to perform what the word of God says he can perform. Amen. That's a good word. Not because it came out of my mouth, but because it came out of the Bible. I want to look a little bit at what Thomas does right here. Verse 16. It says right here in chapter 11, verse 16. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So Jesus had told them that, plainly, that Lazarus doesn't sleep, he dies. And I'm glad that I wasn't there, so that you too could believe. 
So Jesus wants to perform this miracle so that his disciples can see. Amen. And he, and, and he tell, and so when Thomas hears this, he thinks to himself, let us go there too, so that we can die also, because I want to believe. Now I want you to think about that. That, that passage of scripture has never jumped out to me like it did, you know, this time. Thomas doesn't really understand exactly what's going on. That's obvious, right? But what Jesus is wanting, but what he does understand is, is he loves his Lord. He's seen enough come out of the ministry of Jesus to know that he wants to be able to believe whatever it is that the Lord's telling him. The main thing that I want you to know is this, is that there's going to come a time in your life that you're going to have to be willing to believe that you're going to have to want to die. If you're going to move forward in the things of God, if I'm going to move forward in the things of God, there's going to have to come a time in our life where we're going to be willing to die. Amen. And that willingness to die never ends. That's right. Well, let me give you an example. Whenever I get into a heated, passionate discussion with people, Matt has to come to a place in his life where he's willing to die. I understand there's a place and a time for everything, but you know what? I'll keep making excuses till the day is long. There comes a time when Matt has to be willing to die to always try to be right and to always try to confront every, every single situation as though he's going to fix everybody else's problem when the reality of it is that he ain't going to fix nothing. Only the Holy Spirit's going to be able to fix it. There's some faults in Matt that need to die. And guess what? As you walk this Christian journey, you're going to come to the realization as the Holy Spirit, through the Word, begins to deal with your heart that there's things in you that have to die. Amen. And whenever you see that, guess what? The same faith in Christ that died to get you into heaven is the same faith in Jesus that died to set you free Amen. from all of those elements of your life. It don't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter how simple it is. One of the first things that has to come to the realization is you got to come to the end of yourself and that in that issue, and you got to say, "Lord, I want to die." Thomas said he wanted to die. Now, unfortunately, even once Jesus resurrected, Thomas is the one that doesn't even get it. Right? You remember the story? Isn't that something? He said, "Let us go to that we may die." He's the one that doesn't even get it. But what Jesus tells him is, "Stick your finger in here, Thomas." After Jesus resurrects from the dead, stick your finger in here, thrust your hand in my side. Thomas is like, oh, Lord, now I believe. He said, well, blessed are you, Thomas. You believe. You got to see physically and you believe. But blessed are those who don't see. <coughs> Hallelujah. But yet they will believe. Amen. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is this. Sometimes there's things in your life that you're not going to be able to see. But yet you got to keep believing. Yeah. See, one of the main things that I believe is an emphasis point about the ministry that we have here is that we preach you can call it what you want. The message of the cross, the new covenant, the finished work of Christ, the gospel. That's what it is. And what we believe is, let me just take a second here to say this. Many, through the years, we've been accused even of being a cult. Because we said that we had the right way. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, we do have the right way. But if we're not a cult, it's because we're, we're interpreting what the word of God says about the right. What the Word of God says about the right way is, is that Jesus Christ and what He did for us on the cross, when He said it is finished, He broke the power of sin and gives you access to the presence of God. Now, the, now the, most people will say, well, hold on a second, preacher. What is it so different about what you're saying, amen, that other people aren't saying? Well, let me explain to you. Many people will talk about the fact, I didn't really know I was going to go here, but I am. Many people will talk about the fact that mankind <clears throat> was born... <clears throat> broken and dead in Adam and that they need Jesus and what he did for them at the cross in order to be saved from sin and in order to be able to go to heaven and so when you put your faith in what Jesus did for you at the cross God puts you in Jesus amen and the Bible teaches that you die with him that you were buried with him and that just as he was raised from the dead you too should walk in newness of life now, but what I want you to understand is this. The difference between what we preach and what some other people may preach is this. Is the pathway to victory. How is it that I get victory over the thing that plagues my life? Come on, preacher, tell me. How do I get victory? Oh, how are you, preacher, going to get victory over the fact that even though somebody tells you that people that you know that are addicts are never going to get better, how is it that you're going to get 
victory over the fact that you get angry and that you come against them the wrong way. How are you going to get victory, Christ, uh, preacher? We're going to talk about that. How are you going to get victory in your life when you find yourself in the dark when nobody else is looking and you're on the internet looking at pictures you ain't supposed to be looking at? Come on, somebody. We're getting real now. Is it okay if we do that? See, the Lord said, you just got to preach it like it is. Right? Amen? Just tell the truth. Because that's a bondage. And people are in bondage to that. How are you going to get free whenever that little, like that, that one crackhead that I was talking to one time? I don't mean to call him a crackhead. That sounds derogatory. I don't mean it that way. That's what he called himself. He said, give me a little cookie of crack, boy. And I mean, he was like preaching crack. It was so beautiful to him. And how are you going to get freedom from that little cookie of crack that keeps bouncing around in your head and calling your name. I never had the cookie of crack call my name. I thank God that I got out of that stuff before they came, that, that stuff became popular. But it messed up some people. How are you going to get free from the wrong relationship that you're in the midst of? How are you going to get free from whatever it is that plagues your life? That's what we're trying to explain to you. The modern church will tell you you need some counseling. The modern church would tell you you need to add some psychology to your theology. The modern church would tell you that you need to read more Bible, go to church more, pray more, do all of these things, and that everything's dependent upon you. What the gospel of Jesus Christ says, the same way Colossians 2, 6, that you received him. How did you receive it? Yeah, faith. faith. Faith in what? Faith in what he did, amen? Faith in the fact that he was the anointed one and that he died on the cross for your sin. The same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. That means each and every day as you're walking with God, walking with Christ, and these things are happening in your life, you're realizing, Lord, I'm dependent upon you. I'm dependent upon you and your grace to change me on the inside. God's grace flows through proper faith. When your faith is in his plan, which is the giving of his son, dying on the cross, he responds by giving grace. I don't care what you're going through. I heard one time somebody said tragedy had stricken somebody's life. They said, well, they don't need to hear the message of the cross right now. What they need to hear is just to have an open ear. I'll tell you this. People need an open ear to hear whenever things are going on. But I don't tell me a little bit about tragedy because I'm experiencing my own self. My sister, my sister killed herself. And when my sister killed herself, I was in the worst place and predicament of my life. I was hopeless. I was helpless. I had been a Christian for 12 years, and I did not know the first thing about how to access God. But then I heard a brother Swagger talking on the radio. Come on, somebody. I went, how, why wouldn't you want to listen to somebody that's done been through some stuff and been broken in his own way? And, and the Lord would speak some. And listen, he talked about this right here. This is Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. That the old man was baptized into Christ. Buried with him and resurrected to newness of life. We're talking about resurrection this morning, but not just physical. We're talking about spiritual. Thomas had to believe and had to come to the place where he wanted to die. And you sometimes we got to want to die. But let me tell you, when I was in that place of misery, didn't know how, didn't know how to let God heal me. And I heard that message. And I put my faith in the right object. Basically, what I was saying is, is this. God, I'm helpless. I'm helpless, Lord. I, I can't fix it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remedy it. There's people out there and they look down on me. I know that they do. They look down on my family. They look down on me. They, they, people that look at my own life and they look down on me. Have, have you ever felt that way before? Amen. I mean, come on, just be real with me. I'm telling you right now, if you give your heart to Jesus and you start trying to live with the Lord, they're going to make fun of you. Mm -hmm. They're going to talk bad about you. They're going to elevate themselves and try to, try to put you down. Mm -hmm. And you think that that had never happened to the preacher? I'm learning. Lord, I can't change their perception on me. And sometimes it hurts. Yeah. But one of the things I learned is, is that I put my faith in Jesus. Amen. Grace is flowing. Amen. Amen. Grace is flowing and he's Amen. healing me. Yes. He's mending me. He's changing things on the inside of me. He's teaching me how to walk upright with yeah. the Lord. He's becoming my strength. He's becoming my warrior. And more of Matt is dying, and more of Jesus is living, and each and every day the resurrection power of the Lord is taking over and strengthening me. Don't tell me that people don't need to hear the truth of the gospel, because guess what? It does good, and I'll give you my ear. I'll listen to you. Amen. But if I don't ever give you the right way to walk with the Lord, you will never grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Listen, you need the grace of the Lord working in your life. You know what grace means? For instance, we've got some new people here. Let me give you this definition. <clears throat> Grace. 
A lot of people think it means I messed up, I need some help. And, 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 and you know, that's true. Grace is God's unmerited favor. <clears throat> In other words, you can't earn it. You can't read enough of the Bible to get God's grace. Did you know that? Yeah. Jesus purchased it for you at the cross. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But there's an, there's an aspect of grace that does something in your life. And this is what it does. It's a divine. What does divine mean to you? Holy. Holy God. It's related to God, right? It's not related to you, right? No. Divine influence. Influence changes things, doesn't it? It's a divine influence on the heart. Now, do you think that the Bible, when it uses the word heart, is talking about that organ that sits in the left side of your chest and pumps blood to your body, bringing oxygen to your cells and causing the Krebs cycle to take place and removing carbon dioxide and giving oxygen? Do you think that that's what it's talking about? No. It's talking about your inner man. It's talking about the inner man, the soul and the spirit of man. Amen? That which is alive or dead to God. Whenever you're alive to God, when grace is flowing, when your faith is in Christ, the God of glory, the Holy Spirit releases grace into your life. And grace is a divine influence on the heart with a reflection in the life. Reflection in the life. And so what does that mean? It means that you're being changed inwardly and it's being reflected outwardly in your life. So that means whatever your problem is, Pick your poison. Some people ain't got your problems, so they think they're okay. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not okay. If you think you're okay, I can assure you you're not okay. Because now your problem self-righteous is in a lying tongue. Amen. Whatever your problem is, some people can't handle this kind of preaching. I'm just trying to be real with you. Uh, we're trying to, what, what do you want to do? You want to tiptoe around the tulips and beat around the bush, or you want to get to the heart of the problem? The heart of the problem is, is that mankind is all undone and messed up without Jesus. And the fact of the matter is, is that we all need the grace of God flowing in our lives, a divine influence on our heart with a reflection in our life. So whatever it is that's ailing you, you know in your mind, sometimes you can't see it though. Do you argue too much with people? Do you have a bad attitude? Do people not like you because of that? Do you, need, do you even recognize it? Do you need change in your life? Amen. Whatever it is that ails you, when grace is flowing, it will begin to change you. It will begin to work in you. It will begin to do the work of the Holy Spirit in you. So you got to be like Thomas. And first off, you gotta you got to want to die. But then secondly, you got to be willing to believe in something that you can't see yet. You're telling me that grace is going to work, preacher, but guess what? I'm still bound by the pornography. I'm still bound in my mind by lust. I'm still bound in my mind by this thing that keeps calling my name. Guess what? Keep on holding on. Keep on trusting my faith that Jesus and what he did for you at the cross was Amen. enough to get, give grace into your life, to change you, to strengthen you, to give you the power that you need. Don't try to change it. Don't try to go another way. Don't buy into the counselor. Don't buy into you doing more works. No. Come to the Lord as a little child. Dependent on Him. Lord, I can't do it. I need you to do it for me. I come to you like a little child on my knees. I'm begging you, Lord, to change me. Because listen to me. If I'm telling you the truth and that this life really is about something bigger than what we see today, it's really important that we let God do a work in our lives. Amen. Not only does our life count on it, but other people's lives yes, count. Yes. I had a whole lot more I wanted to say, and I realized that I've gone longer than I probably wanted to. But one of the things that I want to share with you is back at verse 9 of chapter 12. It says, uh, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they may see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. So this is something that happens in people's lives. When you get a hold of the real gospel, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Has God changed anybody in here? Yes. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for the, your obedience in that. I mean, it's good to know that God still changes people. When God changes people, something happens. People want to see it. And even if they're not coming to look for it like Lazarus, I'm, I know that Lazarus was raised from the physical dead. Work with me here. 
Do you realize that God raises people from the spiritual dead too? Yes. And they may not be knocking on your door to, take, to look you in the eyeballs. But, but they're hearing it out there on the street. God changed that person. God did the work in him. And just as they're coming to look for it in Lazarus, they're also hearing about it from you. Your conversion, your giving your life to Christ, is going to have an effect on people in two different ways. And we see it in this passage right here. One way is people are going to want to see the change that's taking place in your life for a good reason. Because they themselves are hurting. They themselves are hurting and they know that things aren't right in their lives and they're looking for an answer. And as you allow the Lord to work in you and change you, the word gets out on the street, if you will, that something's happened. Amen. Listen to me, there's, and there's not a more beautiful testimony than somebody who their life wasn't all messed up, or at least on the outside, and they gave their life to Jesus and they start professing Jesus. Well, why? You know how many times I've talked to people before that give their life to the Lord and weren't really messed up? And people, they would tell me, people would say, but... But everything was fine. Mm -hmm. No, everything's not fine. Mm -hmm. I'm not okay. In, in, in other words, if, if I'm, Jesus isn't my Lord and Savior, I'm not okay. Yeah. Right. You know, whenever I was having a conversation with, uh, with a person, it doesn't matter who it was, that was another thing that, that's been brought up. Is that, you know, all you ever want to talk to, or that I made the comment one time, I like talking to broken people because they're ready to receive <laughs> Now that person flipped that around and said, yeah, you like talking to weak-minded people so that you can tell them what they want to hear, what you want them to hear so that they'll believe what you say. Oh, you got that from dude? Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. No. What I'm trying to say is, is that I was prideful. And through tragedy, and Lord knows I need more breaking in my life. But through tragedy, I was broken. And when I was broken and humbled, I was willing to listen to the Lord. Amen. I was willing to listen to the truth. And one of the things that I've realized is this. Is that broken and humbled people are willing to listen to the truth. Amen. Versus people that think that they're perfectly fine. Amen. They think they got it all figured out. Amen. And Jesus talked to them. He told the Pharisees. That the, that the well folks don't need a physician. Amen. I've come for the sick. They weren't really well. They just thought they were well. Mm -hmm. They could not see their own selves. They could not see the conditions of their hearts. In this passage that we just read, some people came to see Lazarus because he was alive from the dead. And because of that, they also, the scripture says, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But also it says in this passage of scripture, it says, but the chief priests, verse 10, consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Why? Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. You see, the gospel changing your life has an effect on people two different ways. Number one, some people are going to see the change in your life and they're going to want to believe on the same Jesus that changed you. But at the same time, the same change that's taking place in your life as you begin to pronounce Jesus. I'm telling you right now, it caught, do, do, you, do you understand that you're in a spiritual war? Yeah. You realize that, I hope. Mm -hmm. That everything that you encounter in your life is not just physical. That whenever you see people coming against you in the physical, that, it, that you're not in a war with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and world rulers and, and, and demonic spirits. Amen. And, and that they use people against you. That's right. That's right. To, and you, God, the enemy of your soul will use church folk. Amen. The enemy of, your, of, your, of my soul will, he'll use me against you and you against me if we let him. Amen. And, and the truth of the matter is, is this, is that whenever the self-righteous are encountered or they think their life is fine, when somebody that's going about their, their minding their own business is encountered with somebody that says, things may not be okay in your life. Hmm. All of a sudden, the spirit rises up on the inside of them because now their life's being called into question. And they don't like what they're feeling on the inside. It's like a spirit of the Pharisee. Yeah. And there's a spirit that wants to stop this thing. It wants to stop it. It wants to shut it up. It wants to make it go away. But the reality of it is, is this. Is that it ain't going away. Amen. Not until the Lord takes the church away. Hallelujah. And until that day, I got to tell you that you're going to encounter these types of things. If you're willing, in any way, shape, or form, to open your mouth for the Lord.